So, hello, I'm Helen, and uh, I am a UX consultant, user researcher, a diversity and inclusion champion for a company called BGSS, which hopefully you've seen the video for because we're a sponsor today. Uh, I also work for uh, Spark, which is the creative digital consultancy side of that as well. Uh, I haven't been upstairs because I've been shirking my duties, but I'm also one of the uh, organisers of Women in Tech and Technotium, so go and check out the stand if you haven't already. And uh, I'm a big fan of hot yoga. So uh, this talk today is about uh, inclusion within our industry and making sure that we're designing and building the right things. Now, uh, I saw a really good example of <laughs> What happens when sometimes we don't have things used in the way that they're expected? Uh, and it was this tweet which was captioned, we know our users slash customers. And you don't get the effect from the uh, still, so I pulled the video out. And then watch for that kid, because he's the best. <laughs> So I think this is just such a good metaphor for uh, what happens in our industry a lot. We build things and ship things and put them out, and then people use them in uh, wonderfully unexpected ways and not necessarily what we designed and expected them to do, not the way that they were intended. And this can happen because we're not always really understanding what people are doing, what their lives look like, how we're impacting that with what we're creating. There's a great quote uh, by a guy called Pete Trainer. I'd really, really recommend this book. Uh, it's called Hippo. And in it, he says, we spend a very long time mapping the user journey and plotting the customer journey, when in reality, every human is on a journey we know nothing about. And I think like, I've had this as a kind of personal experience where I've been the, uh, the sort of typical only UXer in the company. So uh, without access to user research, without access to the people who we were actually designing and making things for. And as such, uh, I became the representative user and had to kind of speak on behalf of, of the users. But reading this book and reading this quote, it was it, it suddenly kind of dawned on me, it's like, well, really, I can't represent them because I'm not them either. And as a consequence of this, I think when we're in the world that we are, when we're in the tech industry, it's really easy to be in filter bubbles. Now, the danger of filter bubbles is that you think you're getting a representative view of the world and you're really, really not, and you don't know it. And I think that's the really important thing. We don't we don't know when we're in a bubble. We don't see that we are in these bubbles. I think as well, when we work in agile design and development, which I'm sure a lot of people in the room do, sometimes the speed of which we have to be designing and building and shipping things means that we have to sometimes just ship things and get them out. But the problem with that is sometimes we can end up putting the cart before the horse. And if we're building things without understanding exactly uh, who is going to use it, then we're in danger not only of designing and uh, building something that doesn't work in the way it was intended, like the wonderful slide, but more than that, we're in danger of actively excluding people from using our products and services. So this is a quote from the Microsoft Inclusive Design Manual, which I'm going to come back to in a bit as well. If you're uh, new to inclusive design, it's a really, really great resource to get started. Very, very accessible in the way that it's written. And they say this, every decision we make can raise or lower barriers to participation in society. It's our collective responsibility to lower these barriers through inclusive products, services, environments, and experiences. But the question that I have is that if we're not really going out and meeting people, how can we lower these barriers? Because we don't really know what they are. And it's really, really easy then to work on assumptions and assume that we know what the barriers are to people using our services and our products. So this talk, I've got a few assumptions that I want to challenge. And uh, for the last year and a half, I've been working as a user researcher and, uh, and getting to really understand the audience that uh, we build our service for. And so some of my findings and learnings are in this talk. 
So the first assumption, our digital skills are the same. So I want you to meet Keith. So this isn't really Keith, this is a stock photo, and his name isn't Keith because we keep our participants anonymous, but he is a real person that I went and met. And I went to talk to him about uh, our service and also to understand what technology he uses. And he told me this. He said, I'm not very good with computers. Whatever system you've got has got to be completely idiot-proof because I'm an idiot with this sort of thing. I'm probably the worst person on the whole system. So he's not the worst person on the whole system. And when we looked at what he was doing in it, he was perfectly capable of using the service, but his self-confidence levels were really, really low. And you might hear this quote and think, oh, well, he, he doesn't really have any digital skills at all, but on further talking to him, uh, he has an iPhone. He uses that for emails and, uh, and text and calls, calls. Um, and he has a laptop, he does online banking, but he's got certain kind of um, needs within that. So he, he does do online banking, but he only does it at home, and he only does it on the laptop at home. And that's not to do with the interface, it's to do with the situation. So at home is his wife and his girlfriend, who, quote, could help guide him if he goes wrong. So, uh, so yeah, I was talking to Keith and kind of started to understand his digital skill set. And what we can do uh, using uh, one of the tools from the uh, GDS toolkit is to look at where he would sit on the digital inclusion scale. Has anyone seen this before? No? Okay. Not many, you, the UX are in the room. <laughs> um, so this is a really handy tool to help plot uh, the, the skill set of the people that we're doing user research for. So looking at Keith, he sits around here. So he, he sits within basic digital skills. He, you know, he can use mobile, he can use online banking. Uh, but then you think about us in the room, and we're experts, because we're the ones who are designing and building the services that he's using. And one of the things that I quite like about this tool is that you can automatically see the gap between the knowledge that we have and the knowledge that other people have and the skills that other people have. Now, the problem with kind of going back to being that representative user is that it's really, really hard to get rid of all of that knowledge that you have. And when we try to act on behalf of the people that are using our services. We can't fully experience things in the same way as, as they can. So this isn't particularly representative because it would be really bad to only have one participant. So <laughs> we would talk to more people. And this is uh, an example of what that would look like and being able to plot the dig digital skills of the people that we're working to. And this really helps us make design decisions as well in terms of knowing kind of what, especially things like content design, knowing what language we can use for people based on their skill sets. But I want to look at this lower end of the scale and because uh, there's some quite interesting statistics around it. So uh, as of this year, there are 4.3 million adults, age 15, in the UK who have zero basic digital skills. One-fifth of the population do not have foundational digital skills. So what's a foundational digital skill? They're things that you and I, to make an assumption, are very, very used to. So things like being able to use a mouse, connect to the internet, log into things, create accounts, use forms, all of these things that for us in the room are just completely intrinsic and quite often unconscious actions are skills that there are people in, in the country who can't do. So to put some numbers on that, we've got 4.9 million people who can't use a mouse or a touchscreen. 6 million who can't turn on a device. My colleague Paul actually had a story about that, which was um, one of their uh, participants didn't know how to turn an iPad on. Uh, <laughs> which involved tapping the screen, not the button. Uh, and 7.1, uh, who can't open an app. 
And I want to tell you about a little bit of user research that I went out on relatively recently. And, uh, and it's quite a good example of me not following my own advice because I made an assumption that people would be okay with this. So it's part of the, uh, it's basically a new onboarding process and we had a QR code. Uh, and I assumed that people would be able to scan a QR code. They couldn't at all. <laughs> so we went, this took out to uh, admin staff. Uh, we have run two usability tests on this now and at least half the people haven't been able to scan a QR code because they've never done it before. So my favorite example was um, someone who, I'm going to use the sound phone as an example. So we had, um, there was selfie mode and there was my favorite which was, I'll use my screen too, a sort of, does this scan? Is that what I do? Uh, and they were really, really stuck and really, really confused. Uh, so one of them was like, I don't know, don't know how to do it. I've never scanned anything. I would get my daughter to do that and I would need some sort of idiot notes. One of the things that's quite interesting when we go uh, on user testing sessions is uh, the word idiot comes up a lot and the word dinosaur <laughs> comes up a lot. I don't know if it's just our demographic. But people are really, really unconfident and they don't, know, they don't know how to do some of the things that I, as the designer, assumed that they would be able to do. So Sonia, who's just never done things like that, she's, she's lower down on our scale, she's task specific. If you show her what to do, she's okay, but she is not gonna just like open a website and click about. Uh, and uh, we had a recent one as well where no one scrolled. That was interesting. Um, I was like, there isn't a fold anymore. There is in our service. Uh, and part of the, the kind of findings of this as well, when we took this new system out, this new service that we wanted to build, assuming that people would be able to use it, uh, we took it to um, essentially a focus group. And there was a fantastic quote which one of them said, which was that we need to remember that we're spacemen talking to cavemen. He was like, you think this is easy, but we do just, we don't know how to do this and we don't really know what you're talking about. And part of the reason for that, I think, is again, in our filter bubble, we lie in this world of digital privilege. We know what we're doing and we've got the technology to do it. But for various demographic reasons, uh, skill-based reasons, other things, there are lots of reasons that people are not within our bubble of privilege and then they end up being excluded from it. So uh, especially things like access to tech and the different toolkits that people have, which brings me on to assumption two, which is we think we're working with the same toolkit. So this is your sort of like typical design development tech office. So you've got, I mean, this photo is probably a bit old, but you've got, you know, latest smartphones, laptops, um, your software's up to date, and uh, it's nice and shiny. We might have like a beer fridge or ping pong or bean bags, we like bean bags, and all that kind of like tech scene that we have. But for the people that I work with, so uh, hopefully you saw that Keith was a mechanic, their equipment's not quite the same. So uh, this looks like this. So this is, uh, this is from a visit that I did a while ago. Uh, and you can see there's sort of like a tower PC, uh, greasy printer. I almost wish that I'd art directed this because I really like the angle of the screwdriver, but it was just the table. That's just what it looked like. An oily rag for good measure. Uh, and you might just get a glimpse of, there's like this sort of wooden surround at the top. That's because it's a shed. So this is, that's the MOT office. And that's where they work. And it is completely a world away from our setup. It's completely different. And I'll share a, a bit of research that I did as well, where I went out to uh, do some observation and uh, met this guy. And um, so I was there purely to just watch, watch his day, watch what he did. And um, I was there with his supervisor and he disappeared for a while. So, where's he gone? Oh, he's gone to the computer. Oh, what? 
So it turned out within this uh, setup, and it is actually more common than I expected, the computer isn't near the bay where he's working. He has to go to the computer. So um, this particular uh, guy does a lot of, uh, uses our service a lot, has to log in a lot, and he has to walk through another workshop to reception to log on to our service, hope that no one's booking parts or booking uh, cars in, because then he has to wait, patiently wait his turn, do what he needs to do, walk two rooms, look at the actual car. Uh, and this, this is just his day-to-day -day look. Um, so on this, we were like, wouldn't it be better if like the technology came to you? Yes, yes it would. So from this kind of research, we started looking at making sure that our service would work in as most mobile way as possible and actually encouraging organizations to move to tablets so that their computer and what they're doing is in the same vicinity. And this is the sort of finding as well, like when you're, when you're plotting your user journey, there is no way that we would have assumed that they have to go two rooms across to a computer, because I think especially the way we work within technology, there's never one more than an arm's length away. Uh, and this is why uh, it's important to have user research. Now, I am working on a government service, which means it's pretty much baked in as an essential. And they say, without user research, you won't know what problems you're trying to solve, what to build, or if the service you create will work well for users, which is why it's a fundamental part of what we do. But it's also a team sport, and um, this is where we don't just get user researchers to kind of go off and find things and come back again. We're trying to really integrate research into, uh, into our everyday work. So it's been changed a little bit because it gets updated, but I want to show you our wall. I'm slightly too proud of the wall. I really like the wall. <laughs> so in it, we have, I've got a pointer. So can you see? Maybe not. So this top one is a user journey. So that was the original design that we took out uh, as a quick HTML prototype. And then uh, we summarized some design uh, decisions that have been made on usability and put some of the quotes from people actually using those screens in different, as they were, as they were kind of going along. Um, and I doubt you can read it on the screen, but my favorite quote was, I didn't actually read what you were meant to do. <laughs> and I was like, please, could you read what you're meant to do? Because it's an instruction screen, and that's why you got stuck. Um, but that's, that's by the by, if they, they couldn't do it, so we redesigned the screen to make sure that the flow was better for that. And the bottom row, where we've got the screen designs and all the post-it notes, these are all from our developers. So we've got quite a nice little system at the moment where uh, I'll design some screens, print them out, put them on the wall, basically go take some post-it notes and ask questions, do like look at these from a development perspective. And then they ask me lots and lots of questions, which sometimes I can answer. And sometimes I go, I haven't thought about that. Should we ever think about that before it goes into build? Yeah, let's do that. And it helps them actually um, know what technical discovery they need to do as well. Um, and since the, uh, the wall has been active, uh, we've doubled our sprint outcome, which has been really, really cool. So power to the walls. I wanna talk about one final assumption as well, which is accessibility is for people with disabilities. I think it's really easy to associate the two uh, a bit too narrowly. So inclusive design, which is the thing that I really, really love, combines design and accessibility. Now there's two kinds of accessibility. And I think we often think of accessibility as being designed for people with disabilities. And that is one form of it. But the other form is like literally accessing, like being able to connect to the internet and use devices as well. So uh, currently, 4.1 million adults in the UK are offline. So looking at assumptions, do you kind of assume, oh, it must just be old people? Not necessarily. So actually 48% are under 60, 
47% come from a low-income household, and 32% have a disability. Now, an interesting uh, part of these numbers is when, what asked, when they were asked what would get them online, 75% of them said nothing. Just not, not going to do it. And part of it was confidence. Um, a large part of it was security uh, concerns. Uh, and some of it, uh, one fifth of them say that they just don't have the connectivity to actually get online. And when we're thinking about disability as well, it's, it is a much wider context than just having a disability. So this is the persona spectrum. Has anyone seen this before who hasn't already been to one of my talks? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you. Um, so I love this as a diagram because it isn't just about what well, we need to design for people with these permanent disabilities, but we look at things like temporary situations uh, and situations, just situations as well. And I, I was joking to one of my friends because in the last two months I've had laryngitis and I cut my finger open, so I'm currently like really persona spectrum uh, and <laughs> hurting myself too much. Uh, so let's look at this a little bit more closely. So if we take vision as an example, so you might be permanently blind, uh, you might have cataracts, or you might be a distracted driver, you might have uh, a situation where you're not looking, but it doesn't mean that you have a visual impairment. So there are two million people in the UK who are blind or partially sighted, and this figure is speculated to uh, be doubled by the year 2050. Uh, but one third of people who are registered blind are, or partially sighted are in paid work. And uh, interestingly, individuals from black and Asian populations have a higher risk of diabetic eye disease and sight loss than white populations as well. And you can kind of see this uh, in real life and the way that people are hacking their way around uh, around using technology. So again, my colleague took this stealth picture on the bus. And uh, one of the other things that I want to demo to you, because I think it's really fascinating when you see it, is you know we, we do a lot of knowing that we should design for screen readers. But has anyone seen a screen, screen reader in use, in action? So for those who haven't, it looks like this. So he's navigating around the website and listening to the story. So it's uh, it's skim hearing, which is for a lot of us a skill that uh, we just we haven't had to uh, adapt or learn at all. Uh, and this is actually slower than some people will actually interact with screen readers as well. So there are certain things that we can do. So um, this is a bit of equipment that we had at work, uh, which is a visual simulation set. And in it, you can, uh, it simulates various different visual um, impairments. So I believe that's cataracts uh, that one of my colleagues is wearing. But there's a kit where you can start to wear these and, and get an understanding of what it's like to look through eyes that have got these different impairments. And this is something I think where if we're not mindful of this, we do this. So this is a book called Design for Real Life, which is a really, really great and sometimes difficult read. And in it, they say, we frequently only create idealized personas, attractive people happily interacting with our products and completing tasks. I think the optimistic designer types, me included, are quite guilty of this. So we like people like this. So I don't know what he's using, but he loves it. <laughs> and there's like, and he's in a lovely light office, and he's got windows and like some trees and plants and greenery and he's he's gonna like he's loving the the product that we've made he has no difficulties using it at all uh, but this isn't real life this isn't what people look like 
So, we're going to try an experiment. <laughs> My caveat is we've literally never done this before. So you're like the first audience to ever see this. So it's world, world premiere. Uh, and we're going to do this. It's a pop-up MPC lab. However, it requires some of this. <laughs> so, I've got some questions to see if we can get people. If not, I'm going to be bully. So, <laughs> this is really inclusive. Do we have any new parents in the room? Do we have any parents in the room? Okay, I need three of you to come down. Are you picking? Paul's going to pick. Oh, I haven't introduced Paul. Paul's helping me to this. This is Paul. Oh, there you go. Yes. Okay. Do we have any mountain bikers in the room? Tom. And do we have any people who have never tra never travelled outside of Europe or done long haul flights? Lex. Can we have a round of applause, please? Because they have no idea <laughs> what this is going to be. Okay. So. Paul is going to set some people up. Lex, I need you here. So, Tom's the mountain biker. Tom here. Right. Okay. So, Lex. Hello. Hello. You, I want, well, I want everyone to meet. This is Granny Jean. So, Granny Jean is in her 80s. She lives in Nottingham. We're all going to pretend that everyone lives in Nottingham because they probably do. And uh, this is her granddaughter on the right. And she's just had a baby, and Granny Jean wants to go and visit her great-granddaughter uh, while she can. So, um, what she, she, yeah, so, oh, and her granddaughter's moved to Australia. So she wants to go and visit her granddaughter in Australia. Uh, now, she has visual impairments and uh, some hearing loss as well. So, these are her eyes. Okay. Are you okay with this, Lux? Yeah. Can you put one in? Just one. One Just ear. One. Yeah. Okay. Which is your good ear. <laughs> they're they're new. Good. They've never been used. Don't worry. Um, okay. So she also. This is uh, this is Granny Jean's computer. So her son bought her a really really cheap Chromebook, and uh, she uses it kind of for Facebook and just kind of keeping some things, keeping in touch with family, that kind of thing. So. If you open that, mm -hmm. do you want me to set you up? <laughs> she might have motor issues as well. Whoa, okay. Okay, so you're in Google. We really need you. When we get another iteration, we'll show you the screen as well. So your task, Granny Jean, is you need to find out the cost of a return flight to Sydney. You want to go for two weeks in February. And you would prefer to fly with British Airways because you flew with them a while ago and, and you trust them. So I'm going to leave you to get on with your task. Okay. So you can sit down if you want. I shall go. <laughs> okay. So now we are going to meet Andy. So you are Andy. So Andy <laughs> is um, kind of like a self uh, declared like adrenaline junkie. He likes taking like selfies in like mountain biking and he's gone to the Peak District uh, and he's really really avid mountain biking but <laughs> oh no <laughs> he's broken his arm <laughs> which is your dominant hand okay that's the one you broke okay so wrist yep yeah. okay so um, not only did you break your arm but you broke your phone which is almost worse. <laughs> so you don't have a phone at the moment. And because you don't have a phone, how are you keep, where, where are your appointments living? They were living in your head. You forgot them. So you do have an old iPad. So you are at home and uh, you have to uh, find out how to check when your appointment is, the time and date, and you have an appointment at the QMC. 
So I will leave you to that task. Just don't familiar. <laughs> <laughs> it's <a> too real. <laughs> right. So now we have our parents. <laughs> this is Paul. I can't believe Paul let me actually use this picture. <laughs> so <laughs> Paul has a nearly one-year-old son called Joe. And it's uh, so it's about to be his first birthday. Paul has promised his wife that he would book a party, and he forgot. Uh, this is uh, no any coincidental things are purely something. What's the film extent? Yeah, that it's not real. Um, so he he's been tasked with uh, or finding out which local soft play centre would be able to throw a party. Do you have your phones on you? Yes. Good. So don't start yet because. I want you to actually introduce your children first. Who's this? This is Violet. Violet. <laughs> Good. And here we've got uh, Anna and Sally. Oh, you've got two. You should have two balloons. This is Chloe. Chloe, right. So, uh, your task is to find a local soft play centre that does children's parties, but you need to keep those balloons in the air while you're doing it. <laughs> And we're going to start, and also, just like, I'm sorry, I apologise in advance, we are going to play this. So, so go find a soft play centre, all the balloons in the air. <laughs> it will stop in a second. I thought about looping it, but that's just cruel. How are you getting on? Have you found a centre yet? <laughs> so if you haven't worked out, this is a demonstration about distraction. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should have had the non-parents in the room. You found one. Play yeah. There you go. You can put your child down. <laughs> yeah. Have you found? You all found soft play. Yeah. Fab. Okay. Can we have a round of applause? <laughs> but stay there. Stay there. Right. So. Where's Granny Jean? That's Granny Jean. How are you getting on? Uh, not very well. <laughs> come up. Both of you can come up. <laughs> to blink a bit. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so these were our three people. So, uh, I have some questions. The first being, how did you find that? Uh, it was challenging, it was difficult. Yeah, trying yeah. to concentrate on several things at once. Yeah. yeah. So, a good example of. Um, yeah, distraction and brains are not super good at that. Granny Jean. It was very difficult to navigate BA's website, even without the impairment. Uh, <laughs> impairment it wasn't great. Uh, what I did find interesting was that there was this tiny little link that I did sort of see that said uh, disability assistance, and um, <laughs> found that quite funny because <laughs> it was tiny. <laughs> but yeah, I, I didn't get that far. No, okay. <laughs> and how about you? Uh, I failed miserably. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, all I could find was, well, I, I just had to search for appointments, but that failed too. Okay. Uh, so, um, if I can ask as well, like, are there any things within the design of what you were using that you think would have been better in the situation you were in? Um, not really, because it's a phone and it's only got so much keyboard. The fact that I, I'm, I was, the fact that I've got a search bar on the front of my phone that I can go straight ah. to. Was a, but you was know a how bonus, to do that. And I know how to do that. Yeah. Now, uh, I know a lot of people, especially if they've not got the latest version of an operating system, they might not have that. So. Yeah, cool. And Lex, you're a designer. What could have been better? Um, All of it. <laughs> basically, when I was searching for somewhere to go, I knew what I had in mind. And the website 
tried, from what I could see, tried to give me a load of different other options, like, maybe you want to try this, you want to try this, you want to try this. I was like, I just want to go to Australia. Yeah. <laughs> so it was too much information. Too much, yeah. Especially for someone who's really looking for yeah. something specific. So. And was there anything for you, Tom? Was that uh, more a content issue? Or? Partly a content issue, partly a mechanism issue that they, I don't think they'd like anyone to do anything other than just ring them. Yeah. But also making some massive assumptions when you land on the website about who you are and what you want to do. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. So um, that's, that took less time than I thought. That's good. <laughs> We're still on time. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Can we have another round of applause, please, for everyone? <laughs> The, uh, the goggles will be around as well if you want to, uh, to have a play later. So this, uh, this accessibility, not accessibility really, this um, Empathy Lab kit uh, is in itself, I think, quite accessible. So this is it. Uh, so we've got goggles, sandpaper, uh, balloons, that kind of thing. And this is what it cost. So uh, it's less than 15 pounds. Uh, so it's a really low cost to entry to actually start implementing some of these things and um, I have to say as well this is not the same as like proper usability testing <laughs> like that's this is way lighter than that but this is about giving people a sense of um, really understanding what it's like for people with uh, impairments that they don't have themselves uh, so it's really good to, uh, to have this experience because not only does it make you empathetic, but it really puts you uh, really in, in the shoes of the people that we're, we're trying to understand. And uh, the other thing really is that it's, it's super important when we're looking at things like accessibility that we don't treat it as that added extra, like, oh, we'll just kind of whack some accessibility in the end. It's something that we really want to be putting all the way through our design process. Because designing for inclusion makes things better for everybody. So, not only is it a good thing to do, and a right thing to do, and a legal thing to do, especially uh, when we're, if you're in any government services, it, it has to be <laughs> completely compliant, but it's, it's good in terms of Granny Jean and Andy and the parents. The examples that you've seen here today, they don't have disabilities. It's the situation that they're in that can impact their lives and what they're doing as well. And making things accessible and designing for inclusion means that it is better for everybody. And uh, going forward, what I would like to see and practice myself as well is that it isn't just about empathy it's about having compassion for people as well so it isn't just knowing that oh well this should work for this person it's like really understanding why and being really mindful of that as well so that's me <laughs>